Churches are dying today, they say. The title of my message is Dying Churches by Gnostic Poison. Gnostic Poison. Our text is in Revelation chapter 2. Let's read two verses. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which also I hate. Dear Father, bless us now as we look at this battle of the ages that is culminating now in our nation, in the world. And we do pray, Father, that uh, through all of this, that all who hear this message will be moved to greater holiness, to greater watchfulness, and to keep things, Lord, as you intended them to be. Proper order, natural, in Jesus' name, amen. He's talking to a pastor in the last book of the Bible, the last words of the Lord Jesus, a pastor of a church, and he's saying, Remember from whence thou art fallen. And then he gives a warning. And then he gives some encouragement in regard to the things that he has appreciated in the pastor, in this church. Starting in the very first verse, he says unto the angel, that's the pastor, you see the word evangelist, it has the word angel in it. Angel means messenger. There's heavenly messengers. There's earthly messengers. I am to get the message from the word of God and proclaim it. You are to take the message from the word of God. And you are to go out into the world and witness. But there is the office of a pastor, a bishop, an angel. Unto the angel, this pastor of the church of Ephesus, write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his hand. The stars were pictures of these seven pastors that he was writing letters to in Asia Minor. Who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. What are the candlesticks? People say you can't understand the book of Revelation. Well, it, it tells you right in the book what the symbols mean. I mean, look over here at chapter 1. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. A candlestick is a church. Because that's what it ought to be, right? It, it ought to be a place to, um, to manifest the light, to support the light. So keep that in mind. So when he gets back here and says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou cannot bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and has borne and has patience and for my namesake has labored and hath not fainted. A lot of good things that this church has done, the pastor has done. One of the things is they've been watchful. They don't allow false teaching to come in. They've labored. They've, they, they haven't fainted. He's looking at their past history. But now after encouraging, he gives a nevertheless. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place. Except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which also I hate. Okay, what is he warning this pastor about? 
it, it, it seems that the pastor and perhaps the rest of the church has become less zealous. They've lost their intensity. They've lost their fervor. So he warns the pastor that I'm going to come take your candlestick out of its place. He didn't say, I'm going to take you out of your place. I'm going to take your candlestick out of its place. The candlestick is the church. Now, if you see something that says Jesus saying, I'm going to come unto you, I'm going to come unto you quickly, uh, he's talking about the second coming of Christ. Now, from the time of the first century, the Lord could have come at any moment. The godly Christians all down through the ages, looked for the Lord to come. And even though they believed there was a general timetable of 6,000 years, they knew the Lord's words that He could come suddenly. He could come early. He could come at any time. So they need to be ready. How much more should we be ready in this day and age? So what is He saying? He's saying that somehow or another at the second coming, this church can disappear. A church is made up of people. He's not talking about the building. He's talking about the building is the tool. Praise God for it. But he's saying, I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place. This is the first stage of the second coming. And people have confused the rapture so much. The rapture is what people call the catching away while still alive of believers. And in modern times, the popular idea is that every Christian goes up. And that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that the rapture is a reward, the first rapture and that you are to watch for it, you are to pray for it, you are to hope for it, you are to get in the way of the devil and do whatever you can do, like Enoch did, that you may be translated as the biblical word that is caught up before all these things. Luke 21, 36, watch and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all of these things and stand before the Son of Man. Now let me show you how the Lord describes the rapture. But if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, he's already showed what's going to happen to the faithful servant. The Lord's going to come get him, and uh, he's going to be taken to glory, to honor. But this fellow that says, My Lord's going to delay his coming, he loses his zeal, he loses his holiness, begins to smite his fellow servants. You know, those are the ones that are living right, just like Cain hated Abel. They're going to name call, slander, and to eat and drink with the drunken. Listen to this now. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Therefore, when the rapture happens, the Bible likens it into the first fruits of a harvest. I always give the example that if you go look at your plum tree and it's early, it's not late summer, you might already see a ripe plum, a ripe peach. You're going to take that inside and put it to use. But you might look down and say, hey, a worm got a hold of this one, and you're going to pluck that one too. What are you going to do with the green ones? You're going to leave them in the sun, right? So when the Lord comes, the first fruit rapture, he looks down and says, who are the bad Christians down there that are rotten? Okay, I'm going to take them immediately to the judgment seat of Christ, and they are out of here. They get in a lot of trouble. They miss the coming kingdom. The good Christian that's faithful and doing a good job hasn't cooled off. He's going to be taken to a higher office of glory to help the Lord and the angels administer judgment throughout the tribulation period. 
But during this terrible time that's to come, there's going to be some green Christians left behind, left behind. And I don't know how else you would, you, you would interpret. Th th this is so plain right here, and it's so plain in Revelation chapter 2. I'll take your candlestick out of the way. A pastor that's cooling off could easily have a congregation that's cooling off. And when you begin to cool off, what happened to David when he began to relax? He decided to take a break. When it's time for kings to go to battle, he decided to take a break. And he took a nap. And then all of a sudden, there he was on the roof, and he fell into adultery. You see that? So when you allow your zeal to cool, when you allow yourself to relax, and I tell you what, you start enjoying the world and eating and drinking with the drunken, and before you know it, I tell you what, you are in a lot of sin. And what the Lord is saying is, you better watch, you better watch, because I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of its place. Maybe there's some good people in that church. Well, they're going to go up. The bad people are going to go up too, to judgment. Pastor's not going to have anybody there. Now, there are also prejudgments. Meaning that when you look at Matthew 24, and he says, I'm going to judge you at the second coming of Christ, don't think God can't judge you right now before the second coming. Look at Ananias and Sapphira. Look at chapter 10 of Corinthians. Look at chapter 11 of Corinthians. So what I'm telling you is, although at the rapture some churches are going to disappear in judgment, some will be left behind. God at any time can judge a church. There are churches under judgment right now. There are churches dying off because of judgment. And book after book is being written about why are churches dying? Why are churches dying? I haven't read a single one yet in all the church growth movement and all of these seminaries. I haven't read a single one that says they're dying because maybe they're being judged by God. Maybe he's killing them off. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. What you need to do what the Lord wants us to do is stay with the intensity of our first love for the Lord. Now, you had to have one time have had such intensity. Maybe you've never had that type of intensity. Maybe you have it now. But once you get it, the Lord does not want you to lose it. He does not want you to say, wow, remember back when I was really walking in the Lord? Remember when I was very careful and loving the Lord and my Christianity was fresh and I was excited about the coming of the Lord? I was excited about spiritual things, but, you know, I have some bad habits now that I didn't have then. God does not want that to happen, folks. God does not want that to happen. What caused it to change? Sometimes people get offended in the Lord. John the Baptist thought that he was going to be, uh, Jesus was going to at that time set up the kingdom of God. And uh, he was in prison. He's like, I don't understand this. I'm very confused. John the Baptist. And the Lord told him, blessed are they who are not offended in me. A lot of believers set out in their Christian life and something bad happens to them, so they get mad at God. They get mad at the church. And really, they use it as an excuse. Psalm 73 says that it's easy to backslide because you look at people who are not living holy and they seem to be for a time prospering, and that can become a stumbling block 
to you. I remember as a young teen using the failures of those around me, the sins of those around me uh, as an excuse. I used it as an excuse and the Lord taught me that he's not going to put up with that. No, no, no. You go ahead and, and think you have a good excuse to get out here and taste of the world. The Lord will take care of you. He'll have to teach you. So the goal is to always remain thankful. To always remain thankful for the Lord's loving kindness and mercy, we have to remain humble. Humble people are grateful people. Remember when um, Solomon chose, out of all the women that he could have chosen, he chose one. But she said, look not upon me because I am black. Because the sun hath looked upon me. She means my complexion is not as pretty as the other girls. And she gives the reason. My mother's children, her sisters, were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyard. She had to work outside. But my own vineyard have I not kept. In other words, this is one of those examples of a girl that doesn't know how beautiful she is. But maybe that's what Solomon liked in her. Amen. Maybe it was that humility. She didn't know how beautiful she was. You know, it's a wonderful thing when both husband and wife think that they do not deserve the other. Isn't that a beautiful thing? That's how it should be. Now, the church, as the wife of the Lord Jesus Christ, we ought to be humble. Our church ought to be humble. And I think some churches are dying because they've left their first love instead of living for the Lord Jesus and say, I'm just so grateful to be saved. I'm so grateful to be used by God. I'm so grateful He would use our church. All of a sudden you get proud like Laodicea. And you say, you know, we don't really need God. Let's just kind of look in the mirror and uh, look at ourselves, you know. So they sing songs about themselves. Everything's about self. The Bible said in the last days they'll be lovers of their own self. So many churches are dying, and many will die off in the near future as a judgment for God, a judgment for pride, a judgment for not being careful, a judgment for embracing errors that come in. And what these errors do is they turn you towards self. This is what the psychology movement did. The psychology movement was just a Gnostic movement. And it taught churches and pastors started writing books and psychologists wrote books about how you need to love yourselves. You know, Bruce Naramore, Robert Shuler, all of these types that you need to love yourself and learn about self-love. It's all about you. But this Gnosticism also brings about some other problems. The Gnostics are these New Age occult Christians. It started at the beginning in Genesis, in the Garden of Eden. And it has continued throughout the ages and it is gathering momentum like never before right now for the final battle. I wrote a book, Half God Said was my basis for it. The serpent told Eve, Half God Said? He denied God's word. So I wrote the book, The Word God Will Keep It, to show you that you have a Bible today. God hath said. God hath spoken. You can be certain of the words of God. I spent a lot of time in my life putting that book out. The devil also said, Thou shalt not surely die. There's no accountability for you, so I wrote a book on the accountability. Spent years working on it, showing how we've lost accountability for Christians. You could have eternal security. I believe in it. I believe in salvation by grace through faith alone. But you better understand there's accountability for Christians, and so many Christians don't believe it. We've lost it. We've lost what the former generations taught. So I wrote a book about it. But I said there's one final lie of the devil that I'm going to devote my life too. And I'm going to write this book called The Androgyny Agenda. It's on my computer right now. I began to work on it back in um, over 20 years ago. I said there's this androgyny agenda. The devil wants to take mankind 
and he made, God made them male and female, and the devil wants to scramble you up so you're not natural anymore. You're some monstrosity. You're some perverted thing, and he wants the man to look like a woman and act like a woman. He wants the woman to look like a man and act like a man, and he wants the whole thing all scrambled and perverted. That's what the devil does. I found out long ago that there has to be some bait that the devil gives you. So what the devil did, he says, if you will switch sexes or just act like it, get as close to it as you will, you will find power. You will find godhood. So that's why my book was going to deal with the third lie. And I have been hindered by the devil for a decade trying to get that book out. And while I was trying to get the book out, I take a look, and all of a sudden now, it's exploded to where this transgender thing, you've got men that are saying they're women in women's sports. You've got elementary schools. You've got classrooms. You've got drag queen library hour. You've got all of this stuff going on, and now it's just right in our face. But still, nobody understands why. You must understand. To discern the times you're in, you must understand this is a battle between Satan and God. This goes back to Genesis. For 6,000 years, this battle has been gathering steam, gathering steam. It's not just that some people decide that they want to be homosexual. There is an occult, an occult foundation. There is a demonic foundation to this. When the Lord Jesus says, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, he was talking about this very battle. He was talking about a group of people that said they were believers, but they were coming in and saying, listen, if you women will become masculine, you'll find power. If you men will become feminine, it's all about androgyny. It's all about you understanding the feminine principle. And you will be as gods once you find it. The kingdom of God will come once you realize this. That's what the Nicolaitans were teaching. So think about it. What happens when you, you can disguise this occultism as feminism, but I'm going to tell you something. I've documented it before. The early feminists were occult. They were Satanists. They were Luciferian, many of them. You wouldn't believe what some of these early feminists said. You wouldn't believe what Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the first feminist in the 1800s, said about God, about Moses. She said, you got to get rid of the God of the Bible. You have to get rid of that Bible, and there's no other way. The other feminist says, shh, you got to be quiet. Don't, don't show what our agenda is. You're going to lose people. So feminism is the Gnosticism. It was led by Madame Blavatsky, the, the, the occult leader who had Lucifer magazine in the 1800s. It was led by others that we'll talk about. But here's what you need to understand. What happens when you grow up on this doctrine of feminism in America? What's happening to America? Why are people going other countries to try to find wives? They're saying because American women have become feminist. And how can you marry a feminist? So what you have is churches. Brother Brown was telling me about one of his friends that was coming down from Illinois who was talking about churches are dying. Why? Because there's no children. That's one reason. No children. Over 20-something years ago, I decided after every church service, I would travel around Dallas-Fort Worth and visit churches and just see what's going on. Take a notebook. See what I like, what I didn't like, and get an idea of what's happening around me. I was shocked. I was discouraged. I could not believe it. Over 20 years ago, the churches, 15 years ago, the churches were full of some elderly people trying to hold fast to the traditional Christianity that they've been taught. And not a single young person in the whole church. Not a single baby, 
not a single young person. Every now and then I would see a young person and he was sitting over there with green hair and on his whatever game he was messing around with, nobody even tried to rebuke him and said, boy, why don't you get up and listen to the preacher? He did his own thing. He sat over in a corner and made noise, did whatever he want, got hooks all in his nose and eyes. That was the only young person they had in church. And this is repeated over and over and over and over. So what pastor started saying is, what are we going to do? Well, maybe you should ask. What, what they finally said, we got to rock out, man. We got to get some rock and roll in here to get the young people in. And the, that's exactly what Satan wants you to do. What they should have asked is, what's causing people to not want to have children? Some of the most godly people in the Bible that you'll ever run across, Abraham and Sarah, the, the, the parents of John the Baptist, Hannah, they, they, they wanted to have children and, and were unable. Some of the most godly people are trying to have children. Pray for them, fast for them. But I'm going to tell you something. There are so many that don't want to have children. So many women don't want to have children. You've got churches right now where nobody in there wants to have a child. You know why? Nobody wants to get married. Why is that? Because of Gnosticism. Because of feminism. Because of the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. There are so many young people right now, according to statistics, becoming queers. So many are becoming carnal. And nobody cares about the androgynous diet and the drugs that are in the food, the antibiotics, the hormones, the pesticides. So another thing I noticed as I went around these churches over and over and over, they were eating like slop. They, they had no idea about antibiotics and hormones and the sex chain drugs and the intricate disruptors. And they're all saying, we have a prayer request. And just about everybody was dying, not just because some of them were old, some middle-aged people. Everybody had a disease just about. The Bible said, be fruitful and multiply. Get married young. Unless you're odious. Solomon says a lot of the problems come in this world. Odious women get married. If you're odious, if you're rebellious, don't get married. But be a godly young lady. Be a godly young man. If God opens the door, get married. But what's happening? We have abortion. We have children born out of wedlock in the churches. You have men and women working full time. No concern about children whatsoever. Not even trying to have children. And on top of that, you have immature, spoiled, never weaned babies in Christ that are just screaming for, I want my way, I want my way. And so what pastors are saying, we got to give them their way. Does that work with toddlers? And these pastors are finding out, what did I create? I created monsters. Give us what we want. We want rock music. We want disco light. We want this. We want to come to church and look like Harlan. We want this. We want that. And the pastors are like, okay, okay, just keep coming to church. J just keep paying the bills. Y you can't. Y you can't just give spoiled people whatever they want and whatever they cry about. You need to teach people, mature them, help them grow up. But what a compromise, what a temptation it is to compromise that's on the pastors of America today. And, and don't, 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 don't talk to me about it. I don't know what I'm talking about. We were on Channel 5 News. I was a pastor on Channel 5 News. They came into my church and said, this is a rock church. You wouldn't believe what's happening over here. Pastor Joey Foss has a rock church. They came to my church. I said, I don't want to be a rock church. We were just young. I said, we're going to fix that real quick. Millennial cities in 2021 says most millennials, even most Generation Xers, don't actually physically go to church. They've lost it. 
that it does indeed exist, and it all points toward one single fact, churches as institutions are dying. When Gallup first measured church membership in 1937, it was at 73%, a number that would stay steady for nearly six decades. In other words, most people went to church. Membership ticked down to 69% by the year 2000 and then plummeted to 50% by 2018. It's so hard to get anybody to go to church now. They're too busy. So people are saying, what do you do? What do you do? How do we fix this? Well, seminaries and authors are writing books saying, rock on, buddy. Oh, yes, yeah, some old people will leave you. They're going to get mad about it. There's some conservatives among you. They'll leave. Let them leave. Rock on. That's what the churches are being told out here today. That's what they're being told. They actually say, weed them out. If they don't like it, tell them to leave, man. Pacify the hip generation. Just as corporations are seeking to boost their company's environmental, social, and governance ratings by playing the woke game, so the church corporations are saying, hey, we're going to jump to the head of the line. We got to get woke religion. I preached a message about the new religion of wokeism, and I had people write me like, are you serious? You're calling it a religion? I'm like, for sure. Yes, indeed. Now we're a couple years later, and World Net Daily has put out a whole journal on the new religion of woke, you know. It's just another name for Gnosticism. World and Way in 2020, uh, Word and Way in 2022 said thousands of churches close every year, leaving empty buildings behind. Others become breweries, gyms, nightclubs, or some other commercial venture. They went on to talk about a church that just decided they're going to invest in a coffee shop. Sell our building, sell everything, we're just going to be a coffee shop. Now, of course, the devil wants you just like they have politics and polls and, and they, they say basically, uh, oh, th this person, uh, his campaign is dying. Sometimes they lie because they want you to be discouraged. And what they want is this property. See, there's an agenda. They want, and it's been going on since the 1930s or, or before. They want conservative churches gone and they want you to sell out to the rock and roll woke church. See, that's been going on for I don't know how long. So what they're doing is they're going around saying, your churches are dying, your churches are dying. You better sell your property or give away your property to a rock and roll church. See, that believes in homosexuality and abortion and feminism. And a lot of people, a lot of these churches are like, well, we don't have any young people. Maybe we better do it. Maybe we better become a coffee shop. Maybe we better give our property and church to this crowd down the road. And then a couple weeks later, the pastor comes in, and uh, he's not pastor anymore. He's pastorette. And they're like, that's what we gave our building to? What would you think you're giving it to? you got to hold the line, man. If young people aren't getting married and having the babies, why don't you preach what Paul said? they got better things to do. And never forget some good old practical stuff like Lifeway Research says in 2019, most churches would double in size if they simply became friendly. Now, you don't want to just double in size just to double in size. You don't want the wrong people coming in that really don't love Jesus. But you do have to reach out to people. You do have to be friendly, and there are people out there that would come to church if you be friendly and go get involved in their life and, and tell them about Jesus and do what Jesus said to do. See, this is the Lord's method right here. Jesus came speaking to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, go, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father. So you teach them how to get saved, baptize them, but he doesn't stop teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And I'm with you until the end of the world, which means this is still going on. This is still for us. It's not over. You can't say, well, it's the last days. We quit. No, no. He says, I'm with you till the end of the world, which means we got to get people saved. We got to get them baptized and we got to teach them to come to church. 
Well, I don't want to go to church. I know, but you need to. Well, I, I, I don't have time to do that. Well, you got to fix it. Well, my work won't let me. Well, go to your work and tell them that you gotta, you, you're going you're to go to church on Sunday. We're going to seek first the kingdom of God. You've got to train people. You've got to disciple people. Well, they don't want to come to church. Well, well, go teach them, train them to come to church. That's the Lord's way. But Charles Potter, in 1930, in his book, Humanism, A New Religion, says that, you know what, we have your children in public school. This was in 1930, and you've heard it before. For five days a week, you only have them in church one day a week. Within one generation, we're going to have humanism in America like you would not believe, and your churches will die. So Christians began to wake up, mainly in the 90s, and said, you know what, we got to start homeschooling our children. we we, we got to get out of these public schools that are teaching humanism. And you know what they did? They said, well, now we're out of public school. Well, I guess we've done what we need to do. And they left their first love, and they said, now let's just bring Hollywood into our house. Let's bring Internet devices. Let's just bring pop music. Let's just bring all of the occult androgyny. Let's just bring the sewer into our homes. Well, well you end up with the same thing. You might as well just send them to public school. Justin Martyr, an early Christian writer, one of the first early Christian writers said, you know what people did? They lived in farms far away. We all get together on Sunday. This is what Christians do, called the Lord's Day. We get together. We have church. The president reads to us, which I guess they called the pastor, and reads from us from the Bible. We eat together, and then we go home. Don't tell me you can't do that today. You've got to train people. So who were these Nicolaitans? They were New Age, trans, homo, occult people mixed with a Christian dressing. Some say, well, look at the word Nicolaitan. You see Nico, which is victory, and Laetan is people. So this must be people that are conquering. This must be pastors conquering people. So it must have to do with the Roman Catholic Church. Well, yeah, it does have to do with the Roman Catholic Church because the Roman Catholic Church adopted the Gnosticism of the Nicolaitans. You can't say anything today without somebody wanting your licensed credentials. Are you a licensed pastor? That's how we got the Bill of Rights. Is a bunch of Baptists were getting whipped for not getting licensed. They said, no, I don't need a license to be a pastor. My church called me, and uh, that's enough. Well, now you got to have a license for everything. A license to be a doctor, a license to be this, a license to be that. Matt Walsh was uh, speaking to the Tennessee legislature about these trans surgeries mutilating kids, and, oh, you got to go watch that. You would not believe what some of these congressmen were saying to him. They said, Mr. Walsh, what are your credentials to speak against the mutilation of kids? He's like, i got a high school education. I'm a person. i got a soul. It's wrong. I don't need a license, I don't need a degree, I don't, I don't need anything. It's just sick, it's disgusting, and it's wrong. You ought to know that. So yeah, on one side there is this control you, control you by the priesthood. But the word could just as easily mean the laity rebelling against godly pastors. And we certainly see that in Laodicea type of mentality. In fact, that's exactly what Paul said would be in the last days. They'll despise authority. They'll despise government. Paul said that they will not endure sound doctrine. Paul said that uh, basically these people are going to be ungodly and rebellious. So did Jude. So did Second Peter. So yeah, the Nicolaitans, a bunch of ungodly rebels that will not listen, will not be guided, will not be governed but want to live in fornication, and they just go wherever the devil leads them in this New Age movement. But let's go back to early Christianity and find out who the Nicolaitans were by some of these writers. I mean, this is very early, very early. The Nicolaitans, says Irenaeus, are the followers of that Nicholas, who was one of the seven deacons. And, and of course, there's a big debate whether he really fell or not, but it doesn't matter because these Gnostics use anybody in the Bible they want, and they'll even slander him and say something that... They never did. They lead lives of unrestrained indulgence, teaching that it is a matter of indifference to practice adultery and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Well, there you go. So you know what the Nicolaitans are. I can do whatever I want. In fact, we don't need anybody teaching me. I'll do whatever I want. 
Pseudo Tertullian says, Nicholas affirms that darkness was seized with a concupiscence, and indeed a foul and obscene one. Out of this permixture it is a shame to say what? Unclean combinations arose. The rest of his tenets too are obscene. Obviously we're getting over into homosexuality, and, and back then it was so disgusting to even speak about it, you know. Sick stuff. So these Nicolaitans were practicing sick things, but they had doctrinal reasons in their mind for doing it, which we'll show you in a second here. The Lord is praising a church for hating the deeds of the Nicolaitans and the doctrines. I'm even suspicious of uh, those foods offered to idols. I, I bet the foods probably had sex change chemicals and all of that in it because that was really what these cults wanted. They wanted to take every plant, every drug they could to switch their sexual identity. You see, the monks that rose out of this they would actually eat things to try to feminize themselves. You see the Buddhist monks doing the same thing. Hippolytus of Rome in 236 says, There are, however, among the Gnostics, diversities of opinion. Nicholas has been a cause of the widespread combination of these wicked men. So really what you're finding is that the Lord uses the word Nicolaitan for just the Gnostics. This whole Gnostic teaching. This whole Gnostic teaching that was just a mixture of paganism with Christianity. That's what Gnosticism was. The Lord calls them the Nicolaitans. Nicholas moved by a strange spirit, saying that there had been a resurrection to him, for he thought this, that the resurrection was that we should believe in Christ. But he denied a resurrection of the flesh. Well, maybe he did. I don't know, but I'm going to tell you this. Once you no longer believe in a resurrection of the body, then you could just say your body doesn't matter. And so these false teachers come in, call themselves Nicolaitans, and they said, guess what? Since your body's not going to be resurrected, uh, why even care about your body? Dress however you want, pervert it in whatever way you want. Just live to sin. It doesn't matter what you do in your body. It's all about the spirit. So many took occasion. Heresies they set up, but especially arose from those who were called Gnostics, says Hippolytus. Eusebius says at this time the so-called sect of the Nicolaitans made its appearance and commit fornication without shame. You get an idea. Epiphanius of Salimi, uh, Salamis says some of the previous heretics used many base arts to teach their adherents to get involved in promiscuous sexual relations with women and to do unnatural acts that are incurably vicious. It is not right to tell how they do it though. Ones who are referred to as Gnostics are somewhat connected and with the Nicolaitans. So, so, so we're just getting an understanding. The Nicolaitans were Gnostics, and they were sick, perverted, fornicating, sodomites, or things like that. So again, how is Gnosticism, how is Nicolaitanism killing churches? Well, first of all, it's going to make God mad, and he'll just wipe the church out. Uh, secondly, we've already seen it's shunning, church, shunning children. Shunning families, shunning marriage. How can you have a church build with families if you're going to shun marriage? So they end up celebrating lesbianism, abortion, unclean poison food and drugs that pervert their hormones. So Paul says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Get married if you're able, have children, but don't just give them to daycare. Don't give them to the state. Don't give them to Hollywood. Guide your house. Take care of them. Because the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, Nicolo Nicolaitans, Gnostics, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, doing horrible things, forbidding to marry even, Oh, don't get married, girl. Why do you want to get married? Go seek your career. And commanding to abstain from meat, become a vegetarian. Hey, if you have to be vegan because of health, uh, uh, because of a, a, a sickness or disease, that's one thing. But, but to say, I'm not going to eat meat because it's spiritual to not eat meat. Well, why does the, de the devil wants you weak? The devil wants you sick. And he wants your hormones to be in a bad state. 
And then Paul says, for Adam was first formed, then Eve. Why is he telling us that? Because you're going to find what the Nicolaitans and the Gnostics did was reverse it. They said Eve was created first, then Adam. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. The Nicolaitans, the feminists, the Gnostics says, oh, no. Eve was not deceived, Adam was, but Eve helped save Adam. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, talking about the woman. Doesn't mean you have to have children to get saved. It's saying that a godly woman, uh, unless she's called to singlehood, if she's able, she's to get married, she's to have children, and she's to continue raising her children in godliness, and she's to continue being a godly woman if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with, holiness with sobriety. In other words, this is a protection. It's a blessing on your churches. A serial child molester, I just saw an interview with him. He said, how did you choose your victims? He said, oh, I stayed away from kids with active fathers. Oh, I did. He says, I looked for single mothers, and I became the hero to the family. I rode in and helped the family, he said. Hey, stay married, amen? Because not only do you protect your children in a greater way from child molesters, you protect them from Satan's seduction. But listen to everything Paul said here. The early Jewish writings were perverted. The Talmud, Rabbi Yermea ben Eleazar said Adam was first created with two faces, one male and the other female. As it is stated, you have formed me behind him before. In other words, they believe he was created androgynous. Kenneth Copeland, that's what he teaches. You wouldn't believe the pastors out there that say God is androgynous, not male or female, and Adam was neither male nor female, and we have fallen, and what we got to do is get back our original glory by transsexuality. In the hour when the Holy One created the first human, he created him as an androgynous, one having both male and female sexual characteristics. What wicked, wicked evil. The, the Greeks were teaching the same thing. Then in 1945 in Egypt, they discovered some ancient, what they thought were Bible texts, but they were Gnostic texts. They were these Nicolaitan Gnostic texts, and they show Eve as a powerful force and Adam as the passive one. I'm telling you from these 1945 ancient texts, this is what you're seeing out here in our culture today. Everything is about that. Let's look at some of these Gnostic texts real quick. Apocalypse of Adam, written around 50 A.D. When God had created me out of the earth along with Eve, your mother, she taught me a word of knowledge of the eternal God. So Adam is getting taught by Eve, see. We were higher than the God who had created us. Oh, so in other words, if you follow Eve, if you get things upside down and backwards and perverted, then God, the ruler of the aeons and the powers, divided us in his wrath. So in other words, we've got to fix this now. We got divided. We got male over here, and you got female, like in fundamental churches, uniting in harmony together. No, no, we got to fix that. Men have to become feminized, and women have to become masculine. And now we can also, when we do that, let Eve rule. And she will lead us to get paradise back. What they're saying is until Eve is in charge, until you let women rule your churches and let them rule the nation, and until you become feminized and repent of your masculine identity, and until Eve becomes masculine, we will never have paradise. So thunder, perfect mind, written 100 A.D. I am the first and the last. This is their God. I am the whore and the holy one. It's that duality, that yin and yang. I am the bride and the bridegroom for I am the wisdom of the Greeks. Yeah, you got that right. That's what the pagans always taught. And they brought that into Christianity. Wicked. The so-called Gospel of Philip. You ever go to a bookstore and it says the lost books of the Bible? What they mean is the Nicolaitan books. What they mean are the Apocrypha. What they mean, the lost books of the Bible were Gnostic writings that have no place in the Bible because they're of Satan. The so-called Gospel of Philip says light and darkness, life and death, right and left are brothers of one another. They are inseparable. Because of this, neither are the good good nor evil evil. 
Really? We're all the same. When Eve was still with Adam, death did not exist when they were androgynous. When she was separated from him, death came into being. If he enters again and attains his former self, his androgynous self, death will be no more. Christ came to repair the separation, which was from the beginning, and again unite the two. So in other words, the whole coming of the Lord Jesus was to teach men not to be men, to teach women to be masculine, and for you to follow whatever the masculine women tell you, and basically then we can have paradise on earth. Don't you think this is just politics? There is occultism behind all of this. They believe this. The people that have power believe this. This has been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. Look at the news and you just think, wow, why is the drag queen there in the elementary school? Why is it in the library? You are in the middle of the fulfillment of what they call their kingdom of God. The Apocryphon of John, about 120 AD. Who is prior to them all, the mother, father? the first man, the Holy Spirit, the thrice male, the thrice powerful, the thrice named androgynous one. All pagans worship the androgynous, transgendered deity. All they're doing is bringing paganism into Christianity. But praise God, that church of Ephesus, that pastor hated it, and he preached against it. But it began to invade church after church, and right now it's invading all over America. It's not just a homosexual movement. It's teaching women to be out of their place and teaching men to be out of their place. The apostasy of the archons. The spirit-endowed woman came to him and spoke with him, saying, Arise, Adam. And when he saw her, he said, It is you who have given me life. You will be called mother of the living, for it is she who is my mother. Again, Eve is the Savior. Th these are old, old, old writings. This is what the early church was contending with. In the same writings, they say the serpent was the teacher guided by intuition, which they said is what you've got to follow. Don't follow the Bible. Don't even follow your intellect. Follow intuition. The origin of the world. Circa 270 says when Sophia... Let fall a droplet of light. Immediately a human being appeared, being androgynous. When Eve saw her male counterpart prostrate, she had pity upon him, and she said, Adam, become alive. Eve saved the day. Eve saved the day. Albright, in the Goddess of Life and Wisdom in 1920, says bisexual plants which bore their own seed were regarded as androgynous. So in the Bible, you have Tammuz and Ishtar were often androgynous. The planet Venus was male in the morning and female at night. Of course, the pagans believed in all of that. That's why they said, Baal, you're both male and female. When they worship Baal, when they worship Tammuz, when you had women in the Bible weeping for Tammuz, they are weeping for the androgynous one, the transgender. The Gospel of Thomas, the apocryphal Nicolaitan Gnostic Gospel of Thomas shows this. Simon Peter said to them, Let Mary Magdalene leave us, for women are not worthy of life. But Jesus, rebuking him, said, I myself shall lead her in order to make her masculine, so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. Did your Lord Jesus say that? Did he say that in the King James Bible? No! But this is what the Gnostics believe. This is what the New Agers believe. They believe the kingdom of heaven comes when women make themselves male. I'm talking about a spirit. I'm not talking about that you just have a talent or something like that. That I'm talking about the spirit, the, the, this, this attempt to desex yourself and become the other sex. Jesus said to them, when you make the two into one, and when you make the inner like the outer, and the outer like the inner, and the upper like the lower, and when you make male and female into a single one, so that male will not be male, nor the female be female, then you will enter the kingdom. 
This is the New Age Gnostic Jesus, the spirit of Antichrist. And they're saying when you accomplish this in the world, when all of these things have no distinction anymore, everything is so scrambled, you've lost your mind, you're about to enter into the kingdom. What he's talking about is the kingdom of who? Antichrist. Y'all wait. We are right now at the verge of the kingdom of Antichrist. The Bible gives this as the sign, as in the days of Sodom, so shall it be, at the coming of the Son of Man. And the Gnostics themselves say, hey, when everything's scrambled, when everything's yin and yang, when everything's ludicrous and perverted, The Lord said to Salome, when she inquired, How long shall death prevail? As long as you women bear children, says the Lord. No, that's not the true Lord. You understand that? That's this androgyny, Nicolaitan, pagan, bisexual, wicked, occult teaching that has entered the churches in various degrees, Zastriano says, flee from the madness and the bondage of femaleness, you women, and choose for yourselves the salvation of maleness. Of course, men have to become women, women have to become men, and so you end up a monster and worship animals while you're at it. International Journal of the Apocrypha in 1909 says, a cutting from the Daily News, the kingdom of God will only come when you women renounce the dress of your sex. These encouragements to the suffrage campaign Suffragist campaign discovered in the Apocrypha by Mrs. Despard were quoted by her at a meeting of the Women's Freedom League. So, in 1909, she stood before the Women's Freedom League and quoted this ancient Nicolaitan Gnostic text that supposedly has Jesus saying, the kingdom of God will only come when you women renounce the dress of your sex. Well, here we are, about a hundred years later. We must be really close to their kingdom of God, their kingdom of Antichrist. This same Miss Despard decided to speak to the London Spiritualist Alliance. That means necromancers, people that play with uh, trying to talk to their dead relatives. Miss Despard delivered an address on the new womanhood to a large gathering of the members and associates of the London Spiritualist Alliance, and they loved it. She got up there and quoted the same stuff, turning next to the Apocrypha, to these occultists. Miss Despard quoted the less known saying from the Egyptian gospel, the kingdom of God will not come unto you women, renounce the dress of your sex. Oh, everybody clapped. They gave her a standing ovation. They were so excited. They said the new womanhood was now beginning to express itself in the world. One of the great uses of spiritualism, necromancy, they said at the, at the conference, was to help men and women to get beyond all distinctions of every kind, the great teaching of spiritualism. So when somebody would play with, with one of those seances and, and, and the dead grandmama would appear and begin speaking, and the, they said, okay, well, what message do you have for us? He would say, oh... Get rid of all distinctions. Get rid of all distinctions and you'll be God. We'll enter paradise if you women become men. There's a book that was written in the late 1800s called The Perfect Way by Anna Kingsford and Edward Matlin. Edward Matlin in 1905 explained how that book came about in the story of Anna Kingsford and Edward Matlin. Now is the gospel of interpretation come and the kingdom of the mother of God, even the woman, intuition. They said we're leaving reason, we're leaving uh, intellect, and we're entering into the feminine power of intuition. That's why you have so many people saying if it feels good, do it. If I want to do it, if it feels right, I'm going to do it. 
I'm not going to be guided by the Bible and by my mind. Anna Kingsford, who wrote the book, would recognize no hard and fast line between masculine and feminine, human and animal. Even the flowers were persons for her. But the chief determining cause of the change upon which she at length resolved was her reception by night of sundry visitations purporting to be of an angelic nature and enjoining on her for the sake of the mission to which she was called. Then strange people would come up to her and say, listen, here's what we want you to do. For five years, you've got to take a sabbatical. And then we'll come to you again and tell you what you need to do. And so she would get these revelations from these spirits. And they wanted her to write this book, The Perfect Way. It was subsequently incorporated, these visions, into our book, The Perfect Way. We zealously embraced the renunciation of flesh food in favor of a diet derived from the vegetable kingdom. It was to be a spiritual coming of Jesus. The heaven of the kingdom within of man's restored understanding, which he means to understand, don't follow your mind, follow intuition. There was no need to think. In the course of the writing, I became distinctly aware of a presence as of somebody bending over me from behind. And it taught me that I am God himself, once manifested in the flesh, at the right hand of the Father, that I'm one with God, even God himself. What do you think the devil's come to teach you? The devil's come to teach you that you can be God that you are God. But there's only one thing you have to do. You have to get rid of your mind and you have to embrace androgyny. Men have to repent of their masculinity. Women have to take the lead and repent of being feminine. And now, not as man only, do I behold thee. For now thou art to me as woman. Lo, thou art both, as he says to God. O oh, Maria, God as woman. Maria Aphrodite, mother, mother, God. It sounds like the local uh, United Methodist Church around the country. That's what they're doing. In due course, the time came for us to receive the ancient and long lost Gnosis. That is the teaching of the Gnostics. He says, the Lord's first coming was among animals. Therefore, in this figurative coming, we're going to embrace the vegetarian movement and save animals. When you go home, find out what they're wanting you to eat. Find out what some of these plant burgers are made out of. Not just soy anymore. Some are calling them cancer burger because they're made out of cancerous cells. There's some that are made out of human cells. There's some working on feces burgers that... It's just disgusting. This, 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 go read about it. You wouldn't believe what they're wanting you to eat instead of animals. The reign of Adam is, that it is at its last hour. I preached 20 years ago the, or so the coming kingdom of Eve. The reign of Adam is at its last hour. And God shall crown all things by the creation of Eve. When the woman shall be created, God shall give unto her the kingdom, and she shall be first in rule and highest in dignity. Men shall rather say, Oh, that we had been born women. Her kingdom cometh. The day of the exaltation of women against men shall be the reproach. Oh, yeah, a lot of churches didn't even know this book was being written. But all around the country, they said this is the greatest understanding of occultism that has ever been written. We believe this is one of the final revelations to prepare us for the end times. All over the world, in India, everywhere, they said, yes, you have nailed it. This is, you, you pretty much brought it all together. This is what's going to happen. In the last days, men are going to be ashamed of being men. But the creation of woman is not yet complete, but it shall be complete in the time which is at hand. Meaning it's just now starting O oh, mother of God, all things are thine. O oh, thou who riseth from the sea, and thou shalt have dominion over all the worlds. Now this is, this is right out of Revelation 13. 
I believe they think that the beast from the sea is going to be androgynous. Remember it says he won't honor the desire of women? It's as if when the Antichrist first comes, he's saying, I am the perfect androgynous one. I'm neither male nor female, and all the world shall worship him. Of course, later he'll just take off his mask and say, I'm Satan, you women are stupid, you should have never followed me, but, but I'm glad you did, and so it's all just a trick, see? It's all just a trick. Satan wants to be God. And so he's using Eve like he's always done from the beginning to accomplish it. He's telling you women, if you'll become like men, you'll reach Godhood and you'll have paradise on earth. You just got to follow me. You just got to listen to what I say. Don't listen to the Bible. Don't be oppressed by the patriarchy. Don't be oppressed. Just, just follow what we have to say through our devils and all will be well. He says the following instruction to us is a typical one that he got from the devils. Teach the doctrine of the universal soul and the immortality of all creatures. Meaning there is no death. There is no death. You're not going to die. What did Paul tell us? He said in the last days, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. In summary and closing, strive to be natural the way God made you. Strive to be beautiful the way God made you. Rebuke this ugly monstrosity, perversion. You know, the Satanists worship an image called Baphomet. That's half animal, half female, half male. That's the monstrosity. So why are churches dying? Feminism has destroyed them. They're not reproducing. They're not going soul winning because they don't want to make anybody mad. They're not training and discipling people. So if they tell anybody about Jesus, they say, will you please come to church? What would you like us to do on our church? We don't know what to do, but if you'll tell me what, what we can do for you. Hey, I don't mean blessing people and, and being kind. I mean compromising your standards, and that's what they're doing. They're saying, will you fill out this survey of how you would like church to be? Dear Holy God, I do pray that you inspire some women to grab a hold of this. Inspire some children to say, I'm going to be what God made me to be. Father, we do pray you open wombs. We do pray, Father, that you will bring forth godly marriages. We pray, Father, that um, you will help us all be diligent to lead people to Christ, to reproduce spiritually, to train and disciple people, and help us get in the way of this wicked program, this nonsense, this perversion, this stupidity, this insanity of these devils, Lord. Let us rebuke it. Thank you for the precious truth that we have, God. And we thank you that you are loving and that you love us, that you died for us. Now let us be faithful in these last days, in these times of Noah, in these days of Sodom. Let us be humble, godly. In Jesus' name, amen.